Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to discuss the uniform, the exponential, and the normal distributions along with examples. My name is Fred Rispoli and we're coming to you from Stony Brook University. A quick overview for the video is first we're going to discuss the uniform random variable. We'll talk about some of its properties and example and then a follow-up example. Next, we'll take a look at the exponential random variable, go through some properties, an example of the exponential, followed by uh, a memoryless exponential example. And lastly, we'll talk about um, the normal random variable, a few of its properties, a basic example, and then our last example will involve a couple of inverse problems. So I'll begin with plots of the, the PDFs for these distributions. You could see that over here on the top left, that's what a uniform distribution looks like. When you graph it, you get a horizontal line. On the top right, we have exponential distributions over here you can see we get this exponential decay curve these are different values for lambda and down on the bottom we get our well-known bell-shaped curve which is what happens with a normal distribution okay so for a uniform let's say a uniform random variable x if we know x is uniform from a to b then it has a PDF, where f of x is equal to a constant, that's for x between a and b. And you could think of c as what it needs to be so that the PDF integrates to 1. It's one way to say it. Another way is that c is equal to 1 over b minus a, using these values. And a more geometric way of thinking about this, c is 1 over the length of the interval. So this is when you have one random variable. If we have joint distributions, okay, more of a two-dimensional situation, then the constant is one over the area of the support set. A couple of properties that are good to remember is if x is uniform from a to b, then the expectation we could work this out and work out this integral. We get the integral from a to b of u over 1 over b minus a, du. Well, this is surprisingly simple. We get a plus b over 2. And one way to think of this is, you know, a to b is an interval. This would be the midpoint of the interval. All right, e of x squared is sometimes called the second moment. e of x would be the first moment. So the second moment, again, we could work out the integral. The only difference here is now I have a, a u squared instead of the u that we had right up here. So u squared times 1 over b minus a. Integrate with respect to u. When we substitute the limits and, and simplify, we end up with b cubed minus a cubed over 3 times b minus a. And of course, this can be used to find the variance using a, a shortcut formula. So the variance is well-known formula. When we substitute in, we get the e of x squared using this formula right over here. Then we subtract off the e of x. So now I use this, but this gets squared. Well, after we do all the appropriate algebra, we end up with b minus a squared over 12. Again, a fairly nice, easy formula to find the variance when a random variable x is uniform from a to b. Okay, so now let's take a look at uh, what I call example one. Suppose we have a two-dimensional figure. We could think of this as a house. Um, and we know that there's a, a fly somewhere in the house, and the, the location of the fly is uniformly distributed 
you know, across this shape. So we'd like to come up with the joint PDF for x, y. And let's say we wanted to find the probability that the fly is upstairs, meaning in this triangle, okay, using an integral and the, the appropriate calculus. And we'd like to also find this probability a second way, just using areas. All right, so to find the, the joint PDF, we need to find the area of the figure. We know the area of the square, that's easy, 10 times 10 is 100. The area of the triangle, we're using 1 half base times height. So we get 1 half, 10 times 10. So half of 100 is 50. Total area is 150, which gives us the PDF is 1 over 150. Now, to find the probability that the fly is upstairs, we could express this in terms of our random variable y. We want the probability y is greater than 10. Let's just go back a second to the figure and make sense of that. Okay, so here you could see the y-axis. And when y is greater than 10, we're somewhere in this, this triangle, which is the, the upstairs. So that's why we want the probability that y is greater than 10. So setting this up using an integral, let's say we're going to integrate with respect to y first. So, so the inside integration. So y is going to go from 10 to 20 minus x. Right, let's go back to that figure again. I should have it here, but we'll go back. Um, we need to think of, you know, y is, if I shot a ray up, but starting here, I'm just interested in the upstairs. So here, here I have this line, y equals 10. So we're going here, up to this line here. Well, this would be the line 20 minus x. We extended it. This is just the line segment. So that's why y is going from 10 to 20 minus x. 1 over 50, that's our PDF. We do dy. And then x is varying from 0 to 10. So we could start to work out this integral here. We would just get y over 150, put in the limits. We would have something like 20 minus x, but then minus 10. So that simplifies to 10 minus x over 150. Integrate this. And when we put in the limits and, and do all the appropriate algebra, we end up with 50 over 150, or reducing the fraction to lowest terms, we get one third. So that's the calculus way of doing this. We could also do this just by thinking about the areas of these basic shapes. And we could argue that the probability y is greater than 10 is equal to the area of the triangle which is 50 over the total area, 150. And again, we get one third. So it's nice to be able to do this two different ways. Certainly that the shapes are nice and fast, but there might be situations where you can't do the shape. So that's where you may have to use the calculus. Now let's follow this up with some interesting conditional probabilities. Um, let's say that, you know, for this previous fly in the house problem, we want to describe the conditional density of y given that x is equal to 2. Okay. And then having that, we could ask the question, what's the conditional probability the fly is upstairs, given that the fly is on the line. Okay, well, if x is equal to 2, then we could think of this, this red line, right? This is, again, just a line segment, but you could extend this and imagine, you know, a line here. And 
And if I think about the line segments that's contained in this figure, it starts over here. Okay, so this would have value, let's say y equals zero. Um, and it goes to up here, and, and we could figure out what this point is. So if this is, let's say, on you know this this red line is x is equal to two, right? It starts over here at y equals zero, but the red line is x is equal to two. We could figure out that this point is the point two eighteen, right? Because it's on this line twenty minus x, and if x is two then this has to have y value 18. So this is a line segment, okay, that has length 18. So we could say that this conditional PDF is going to be a uniform random variable from 0 to 18, okay. So this would be P of Y given X is equal to two um, would be this random variable. Now we can use that to come up with an answer. Um, we want to know the probability Y is greater than 10 given that the fly is on this line segment. Okay, well, that's not too bad to do. We know that from here, okay, right from the the bottom of the triangle to this, this hypotenuse over here, that would have length 8, right? Because remember, we said this has a y-coordinate 18, so we're going from 10 to 18, so that would be 8. The length of the entire line segment is 18. So we could say that this, prob this probability is 8 over 18. Reduced, we get 4 over 9, or as a decimal, 0.4444. So that's a nice interpretation of these probabilities and conditional probabilities in terms of some basic geometric figures. Okay, let's now shift gears and talk about exponential random variables. So we could say that a random variable that gives the waiting time until the first event occurs, okay. or we could think of it as gaps between events, well, that's, that's an exponential random variable. We could think of our variable x as the time until the next event, x greater than or equal to 0. So there's only one parameter, which is the average rate. Okay, so we'll, we'll call that lambda here. We have to be careful, though, how this average in lambda is used, because this sort of varies from from book to book, um, but here we're going to think of lambda as the average rate, and the PDF is 1 over lambda times e to the minus x over lambda, and this is true for x greater than 0, and it's, it's very useful to get comfortable with the CDF here, right, because we could find a lot of probabilities using the CDF, and here we see that the CDF is just 1 minus e to the minus x over lambda. Okay, so knowing this, you can avoid certain integrals and come up with some quick probabilities. You could see over here in the bottom right, these are some graphs of various exponential PDFs. So these vary depending on lambda. All right, so let's, let's use some of these ideas and come up with a solution for this pretty straightforward example. Call it example three. Suppose you know that the time between consecutive uses of a vending machine 
is exponential with an average of 15 minutes. Okay, so here's a picture of a typical vending machine. We, we see these sort of located um, all over the campus. First question, what's the probability that the machine will not be used during the next 10 minutes? Then we ask how many purchases are expected in the next hour? And finally, what's the distribution for the number of purchases within the next hour? We have to be clear that here we're talking about the time between uses. So, so this is the time between occurrences. And this over here, we're talking about the number of occurrences. So two different things, somewhat related, but they are different. Okay, to come up with an answer for part A, we let x be the time until the next occurrence, right? So x is exponential. And we know that the, the mean number of, of occurrences, well, I shouldn't say that, if the mean time between occurrences is 15 minutes. So if we want to find the probability x is greater than 10, well, it's easy to think of this in terms of the complement. 1 minus the probability x less than or equal to 10. Okay, now we could use the CDF here. So I don't have to calculate another integral. So we get 1 minus, the CDF tells us 1 minus e to the minus 10 over 15. And you can see that the, the ones over here just cancel each other out. I have the two negatives. We end up with e to the minus 10 over 15. We could calculate this in terms of a decimal, 0.5134. So you can see that if you have just x less than or equal to a value, easiest thing to do is to use the CDF. And even if you have the probability x is greater than a value, then it gets, in a way, even less complicated The ones cancel. We just have this e term. OK, the second question, let's just go back and remind ourselves, how many purchases are expected in the next hour? Well, that's pretty easy. If you get one purchase every 15 minutes, then you would expect four in an hour. And when we know the time between arrivals is exponential, the number of arrivals turns out to be a Poisson distribution. And here, would, if we're interested in number of arrivals in one hour, it would be Poisson with mean four. Okay, another interesting property of exponential random variables is described by saying that it is memoryless. Okay, now memoryless in the following sense over here. In fact, let me just sort of jump down to the bottom of this slide and then we'll back up and go through this quick argument. If we knew that x was exponential, and we had a question, what's the probability x is greater than 11, given that x is greater than 7? OK, so you want to know if this was some sort of waiting time, the probability you're going to wait more than 11 minutes for, for some occurrence, given you already waited 7, well, the, the property here says this is equivalent to the probability x is greater than 4. Okay, so that's the sense that we're talking about it being memoryless. Okay? And you can see over here, the way we can figure this out is we simply take 11 minus 7. All right, so the, the general property is <clears throat> stated... Well, it goes along something like this. The probability x is greater than s plus t 
given x is greater than s, okay, well, if we jump to the final result, that's equal to the probability x is greater than p. You can see we just, we, we think about this s, we subtract it off from over here, and we just end up with t. That's what we did down here. We see this, see 11, we see 7, you could take 11 minus 7, and then you just end up with 4. All right, so why is this true? Well, we could demonstrate this using the PDFs and, and the appropriate algebra. The probability x is greater than s plus t given x is greater than s. Okay, so if I think in terms of conditionals, right, this would be expressed as the probability x is greater than s plus t and x is greater than s. Okay, so I have these two together divided by the probability x is greater than s. Well, if x is greater than s plus t, then x is going to be greater than s. So, so this probability that both happens is equal to the probability that x is greater than s plus t. All right, now remember what we said about exponentials and finding greater than probabilities. We can see that there's a quick shortcut using the CDF. So this is equal to the uh, e to the minus lambda s plus t. And then down here, I guess, e to the minus lambda s. So we can cancel out this term down here, e to the minus lambda s. And when I do that, we just end up with e to the minus lambda t, which is just the probability x is greater than t. All right, so what you might sort of suspect in a situation like this can be proved using the PDFs and the algebra. All right, here's an example where we can sort of practice this. Suppose the time required to repair a machine is exponentially distributed with a mean of two hours. I'm going to ask you to find the PDF and the CDF. Find the probability a repair time exceeds two hours. And in part C, what's the conditional probability that a repair takes at least 10 hours, given that its already duration exceeds nine hours? So this is a good practice problem. I, I suggest that you stop or pause this video and try to find the answers to this. Okay, did you get that the PDF is one half e to the minus x over two and the CDF one minus e to the minus x over two? I'm sure you did. Good job there. Part B, the probability x is greater than 2. All right. Here we could use one of our shortcuts that we talked about. So think of this as the complement. When we do that, we use 1 minus the result of the CDF. 1's cancel out. Um, our x is 2, so that's in the numerator. We simply get e to the minus 1, or 1 over e. And part c, so here's a, a good situation to use this memoryless property. Probability x greater than 10, given that x is already greater than 9, is equivalent to the probability x is greater than 1. And we see that we could find this, similar to what we did up in b we get e to the minus one half. Okay, so that's it for the exponentials, some nice properties. Now we turn our attention to example five. We'll start out with uh, a movie star example. 
Suppose that a randomly chosen blonde-haired female movie star has on average 140,000 hairs on her head with a standard deviation of 20,000 normally distributed. And by the way, so here's a, a blonde-haired movie star. Do you know who it is? I'm not going to tell you. So our first question, find the probability that such a person has fewer than 155,000 hairs on her head. Okay, part B, find the probability that such a person has between 115,000 and 155,000 hairs on her head. And part C, let's just confirm the answer to part B using R. All right, so with our normal distribution, what we typically do is we take the probability we're interested in, we transform it into the standard normal distribution, and then we use our normal table to try to find the probability. Okay, so I have the probability x is less than 155,000. So I use my, my z-score to try to transform it. Here we get 155,000 minus 140,000 over 20,000. Or in general, this is x minus mu over sigma. So we could work this out. We could see the fraction becomes 15,000 over 20,000 or 0.75. And we could look up this probability on a table which I have a table on the next slide. We'll just jump to it. So here is our table. Um, so this is sort of the, you could see over here, our phi of z, probability z is less than or equal to z. So this would be the values for the, the CDF. Okay, and when z is 0.75, I have my 0.7 row over here move over this gives me my second decimal place so inside this this red circle we see 0.7734 and that's how we get our answer so the red circle refer, refers to the next slide in part b we want to find the probability x right the number of hairs is somewhere between 115,000 and 155,000. So here we have two z-scores to calculate, but 155,000 we already did up here, so we know that's 0.75. Now the 115,000, well that's below the mean, so we're going to get a negative over here. We get minus 1.25, okay? And in the textbook that we use for this course, we only have uh, a normal table with positive z values. So we have to sort of think about how we could get it. It's, it's still doable because the normal distribution is symmetric. So you see over here, we want minus 1.25. Okay. So what I need to sort of subtract off is the area in the left tail, right? In fact, this is, this is what we want in terms of the standard normal distribution. We use this notation phi of 0.75 minus phi of minus 1.25. So to get, to get this one over here, using our table, what I have to do is look up 1.25 right so that's going to be this 0.8944 well, that's the area to the left of 1.25 if i figure out the area to the right of that value i would take 1 minus 0.8944 okay and that would give me this 0 0.1006 but due to the symmetry the area to the right of positive 0.125 
is equal to the area to the left of minus 1.25. So that's how we get around not having a table for negative z values. So I could get our final answer is going to be the difference of these two. We get 0.6728. Now, what you might do if you have access to R or any other similar type of technology, Excel or Minitab, is we could try to use the technology. So using R, we have this P norm. This is where you put in the X value, the mean, and the standard deviation. But remember, this is... This is like using the CDF. So I use the CDF at 155,000 and then minus the value you get from the CDF at 115,000. And you could see that R would give you output that looks like this. And you could see it's, it's close. There's a slight difference, but there's some rounding that we have to do here in order to use the table. So that's the difference in the rounding. So I would say it does check out slightly off because of the rounding. Okay, one more example. We'll let you practice with this one, but let's just go through it. Suppose you know that children's movies run on average of 98 minutes long with a standard deviation of 10 minutes. Let's say that a children's movie is selected at random. What's the probability that the movie lasts at most two hours? That's part A. I would like to know what's the quartile Q3, right, which is equivalent to the 75th percentile. And suppose we wanted to know sort of the, the limits in minutes for the central 95% of the movie times. So something like a confidence interval, but I'm not talking about sample means. I just want to know the probability that um, if I just had one movie, I'd like to know sort of the middle 95%. So, I recommend that we stop the video, at least try to answer parts A and B, and we'll talk about the answer in a couple of minutes. Okay, continuing, did you get that the probability X is less than 120. Remember, the question involved two hours, but everything else was in minutes, so we have to convert to minutes. So X less than 120 equal to the probability Z less than 2.2. The 2.2 would be uh, 120 minus 98 divided by 10. So we'd be looking at 22 over 10 or 2.2. Look up 2.2 in the table, which I think I have that. Uh, so 2.2 is here in green. We get 2.2. Whoops, there might be an error here, 2.22. Uh, but if it's just 2.2, it would be 0 0.9861. So let's see if we have to fix that. Um, yeah, it's just 2.20. So this 0.98, again, needs to be adjusted to this value over here, 0.9861. Okay, for the 75th percentile, well, what we have to do is use this equation uh, Z is X minus mu over sigma, okay? And we want the 75th percentile. So in a sense, we know the probability 
we have to find the x value. Okay, so the 75th percentile, again, we can go back to the table, and where's the 75th percentile? Well, I want to look up 0.75, but I want 0.75 as the probability, and you see that we might look here um, or here. So which one is closer, uh, 0 0.7486, 0 0.7517. This one is a little bit closer, okay? Uh, it wouldn't be horrible if somebody used this one, but I would say this is the best one. If you want to be more precise, you could use a technology, or you could do something like use the point in the middle. This would give us 0.67. 0.675 would be okay. I think I found the answer with just 0 0.67. So here we take Z to be 0 0.67. Substitute in the 98 and the 10, solve for X, and we would get 104.7. So that would be the 75th percentile. Okay, so what this means is that 75% of the children's movies have a length that is below this, 104.7 minutes, and then 25% would have a length that's more than this. Okay. Now the last part is to find the middle 95%. Okay, so, so we want to know the middle 95% of these movie times. Okay, so you might recall using 1.96 for 95% hypothesis test, right? If you have a two tailed test or 95% confidence interval, this number comes up a lot. Um, so we go about it in a very similar way um, compared to part B. But now, um, we use 1.96 for our Z, right? Just a, a reminder why. Well, 1.96, you can see over here, gives you 0 0.9750. So this would leave 0 0.025 in the left tail and in the right tail. Right, so 0 0.025, 0 0.025, it's going to add up. 0.05, <clears throat> which means you have 0.95 in the middle. So we could use the 1.96. We could substitute it in here, same type of equation. You can see that if you had 1.96 here and you multiplied by 10, you would have 19.6. And then when you solve this for X, add 98 to it, we would get the upper bound of 117.6. And if we use minus 1.96, and then we multiply by 10, we would have minus 19.6, add 98. That is how we would get 78.6. Okay, so this concludes the video. I hope you learned something from it. That's it.